that scene that you see before you is probably the picture that most of us have of the Christmas story. It's probably the most common picture that would appear on Christmas cards, religious Christmas cards that you would get. Perhaps maybe second to the star, the picture of the star and the wise men traveling, right? And in many ways, that, that picture, what we call the nativity scene, captures all the main characters in the drama of Christmas. There is, of course, the newborn baby Jesus. It is his story. And so, it, so much of what we want to talk about is about Jesus and, and the baby who was born and, and who he would become and what he would do for us. There is also, of course, the, the picture of, of Mary and Joseph. And last week, we, we talked about the virgin birth and what a shock it would have been to Mary to, to find an angel telling her she would give birth to a son. And we looked at the story even from the perspective of of Joseph and how shocked he would have been on hearing that, that his engaged bride was already with child. And of course, there's the shepherds. We'll, next week, we'll talk about the story of the shepherds and how they're just out in the field minding their own business when all the whole world changed right before their eyes and who they were and what it meant for them to be the very first recipients of the message of Christmas. And of course, the scenes also capture the wise men and you can sort of see one of them off to the right there in the picture and another one kneeling right down by baby Jesus. And there's the story of the, the, the magi or the wise men. We say three, but really we don't know. We'll talk a week after Christmas about the story of the, of the magi and what that all means to see Christmas from the perspective of these magi. But there's at least one person in the story of Christmas that isn't captured by this picture. And uh, we usually don't like to talk about this person. We don't even like to mention his name because it brings a lot of unpleasant pictures to that beautiful scene of Christmas. In fact, if this person I'm talking about actually got his way, we wouldn't be celebrating Christmas at all, would we? Today we're going to talk about the, the nightmarish part of the Christmas story. We're going to talk about the villain of Christmas. King Herod. We're going to talk about the, this messy story that we find in Matthew chapter 2. Would you turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2? And, and as you're turning there, I want to remind you, in the month of December, we are looking at his story, the story of Jesus, but we're also using that a little bit as a pun on words to talk about the story and ask the question, is this history? Did this really happen the way the gospel writers portray it? And so when we look at this question of, of King Herod and all that's told us in Matthew chapter 2, we ask ourselves, did this really happen this way? Because this is really messed up. This is really messy. This is messy Christmas. But we have to see this as well to see the whole story of Jesus. And, and I want to help to communicate to you this big idea, and that is this, that that Christmas is his story. It's a historical reality about a baby born to redeem a treacherous and murderous world. And that his story needs to become our story. We need to experience the story of Jesus to, to heal our sin and brokenness. And perhaps no other story in, in the story of Christmas really reflects both of those things. The reality of Jesus coming into a broken world and Jesus being able to heal brokenness than the story of King Herod. And as we look at this story today, we'll, we'll consider what can we learn from the story of King Herod about this story of, of treachery and murder right in the middle of the story about the birth of a baby. What does this tell us? And what does this tell us about our story as well? Christmas is his story, a historical story about a baby. But, but as we'll see, it, it is a story filled with a lot of messiness as well. See if you would read with me Matthew chapter 2 and hear the story from Matthew's perspective. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. 
When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet was written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are by no means among the rulers, are, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report him to me so that I may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose ahead of them went into went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up! Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinities who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. In so many ways, this is the story of Christmas that we sort of shake our heads at a little bit and try and understand. In fact, if we read the story in Matthew chapter 2, we want to focus in on the good parts of the story, right? We want to focus on the story, for instance, about the Magi and the star and all of those things. But, but focus on Herod? Why in the world would, would Herod's story be a part of the drama of Christmas as well? I want you to notice that Herod's story really does play a part, and in fact, it reminds us that this is real history. This is not myth. This is not story time. This is a real history, the, that Jesus came into the world in a very specific time under a specific ruler, and Matthew mentions that in verse 1 and 19. And he says that Jesus was born during the time of Herod's rule. And it says that by the time Herod died, Jesus was already a couple years old. And so we place the story of Jesus right in the middle of Herod's reign. Now, you might say, well, what does that really mean and what does that have to do? What's very interesting is that historians tell us that Herod died in 4 B.C., 4 B.C. Now, some of you are saying, wait a minute, I thought Jesus was born in 0 A.D., you know? I mean, like, how could he be born before Christ? And it turns out that actually there was a Russian monk back in 527 who actually came up with the calendar system that we have today. Uh, do you want to know his name? Dionysius Isiguus. Let's all say that. No, we won't. But he was a monk... And in 527, he came up with this calendar system. Many of us think that this calendar system fell out of the sky when Jesus was born. But actually, it was created 500 years or so after Jesus was born to honor the way in which Jesus had transformed culture. Here's the only problem. When he did his calendar system, he clearly was off by about four years. So in reality, Jesus was born probably between four in 6 B.C., he was born before his time, a man before his time, you can say. But now we know when Jesus was born, very specifically, because it's tied to Herod. But what we also know is what was happening during that time in the life of Herod. And the story of Jesus is filtered to us through Herod. And what we can truly say about Herod is that he is truly the Grinch 
who tried to steal Christmas. You know that story, the story of the Grinch who tried to steal the presents from the inhabitants of Whoville, right? And, and tried to ruin their Christmas. Well, that story is just a foreshadowing of the real Grinch who tried to steal Christmas. And how do we make sense of this King Herod who tries to kill Jesus? How does that factor into his story? And what does that mean for us? I want you to notice a couple things that Matthew emphasizes for us in, in studying the story of Herod. He first of all points out that when King Herod heard that the Magi had come to find this king of the Jews, he was, what's the word, disturbed. In fact, one of the things you could say about Herod is that he was greatly disturbed. He was paranoid. He was looking for enemies and conspirators all around him. In fact, he really did have a number of conspirators and enemies all around him. And, and the story of Herod was the story of a man who was always looking over his shoulder. And when he thought there was anyone who was coming near him, he would, he would kill him. The story is littered. He had ten wives and many princes. All of them wanted to be kings. And so what did he do? He just simply killed anyone who came close enough to be in line to be the king. He killed three of his own sons. He killed his favorite wife. He killed his mother-in-law. He drowned a high priest just for kicks, I guess. I don't know. He got angry with the high priest and invited him to a rugby match and drowned him. He killed several uncles and cousins. It was said about Herod, I would rather be Herod's pig than be his son. And to say that about a Jewish person, you know, in the Jewish time, you'd, you'd rather be a pig than be Herod's son. That was the kind of way he treated people. So when he hears that there is someone rising up against him, even a baby, he is disturbed, he is furious, and he does what he normally does. He, he lashes out and he begins to scheme. But what's interesting is rather than immediately go and kill this infant, he's deceptive. Notice what he says. He tells the Magi, oh, that's so great, a child, a baby. Tell you what, go find him. And when you find him, tell me about him and where he is so that I may go and worship him. No more deceptive words have ever been uttered before or maybe ever since. Go, tell me about him so that I may go and worship him. Before I kill him, he would have added. Herod wanted to destroy anybody in his way. The history makes it clear that he, he would destroy anyone. And, and it's, so, it's so ironic that he would use the word worship. On the front of your bulletin uh, this week, we actually have that verse um, on our bulletin. And it talks about how we would... Go and worship Jesus. This is perhaps the most deceptive statement in all of history. And, and, and he is really, truly the person who is, if there ever was a person we could call diabolic, it would be him. Using the Magi as a means to get to the Savior. But before the Magi were fooled into delivering the baby Jesus into his hands, uh, they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, and they left another way. And when, when Herod found out about that, it says what? He was furious. He was furious. He probably screamed and yelled, and he took people and, and did everything he could to destroy anyone around him. He was known as, as just an absolute furious person. He was diabolical. He was, he was filled with rage. I actually believe he was filled with the very rage of the devil himself. The devil who wanted to destroy Jesus from the beginning had his opportunity. He had him in his clutches. He had him in Herod's clutches, but now he had lost him. And he was angry and furious. He was furious probably more that he was outwitted than anything else. And so what did he devise? He devised a plan. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years of age and under. 
can't get any lower, more despicable than that. Kill all the children. We'll make sure he's dead and anyone else close to him in age. This actually gives us an indication that Jesus might have been born a year or two before this incident because Herod is saying, let's make sure we cover all of our bases. If, if the child is two or under, let's kill him. Sounds horrible. This is the story of Christmas that Matthew chooses to tell us. And we say, well, well, why are you telling us this story? This sounds so awful and terrible. And it is. And it is the drama of Christmas. It's the story of Christmas that we don't always want to hear about. But it's a story we must hear. Because it's the story of the real Christmas. It's the story of the disruption that Jesus brought into this world. Every time Jesus entered a place, he disrupted it. And it, and it started even from the moment he was born. There were those who conspired to kill him even from the beginning. And there were casualties along the way. Imagine this story as it unfolds, as it's depicted for us by Franco Zeffirelli in the movie Jesus of Nazareth. And imagine that this is happening right before your eyes if you're a resident of that town of Bethlehem. Kill every male child up to one year old. And two years old. Better the innocent should die than that the guilty should escape. Guilty? Your Majesty, a child? Guilty in the womb! Guilty in the stars! I'll bring down their stars! I'll snuff them out in blood! This is my world! I will not share it with an infant! There's no room for two kings here! Like a newborn scorpion! Underfoot! You know the mark of a real king? Courage! Even in the face of Jewish prophecy! Bits of old parchment! Old blind men! Ha! Now go to Bethlehem! I make history! But your majesty! Kill! Kill them all! Kill! Kill them all! Who question this account in the Gospel of Matthew? Some of them say, oh, come on! How can you believe that Herod would do this kind of thing. Would you really question this history when we know he killed three of his own sons, when he killed his favorite wife, when he killed his uncles, and anyone who opposed him? There's no account in, in history, in, in, in the historian Josephus of this event, so some scholars say, well, come on, there's no way this would have happened. But Bethlehem at the time was probably a city of about 600 people. There might have been maybe a a dozen babies that were killed on that day. Terrible, terrible. But quite frankly, in Herod's world, largely unnoticed. Largely unnoticed because he was so used to killing and maiming people, they hardly even noticed. That's the kind of world that Jesus was born into. A world where treachery and murder was commonplace. That's the kind of world that Jesus came into. And the only good thing we can say about Herod is what Matthew describes next in verse 19. After Herod died. You know, there was, there was so much joy. There was so much anticipation of the day that Herod would die. People were waiting for it. Herod died a grisly death. Josephus describes that Herod's final illness was called Herod's evil, and it was excruciating. Uh, based on Josephus' descriptions, one medical expert said that Herod probably died of chronic kidney disease complicated by gangrene. It was awful. But there were a lot of people who were happy to see him go. 
He knew that that was what was going to happen. And so what did he do? Right before he dies, this is the kind of person we're dealing with. Right before he dies, Herod realizes no one will really mourn from him at his death. And so he hatched one more diabolical plan. He seized about a hundred notable Jews from all around the country in the, in the town of Jericho. And he placed them there under penalty of death. And he said, when I die, make sure you kill them all. So someone will mourn when I die. Well, his sister Salome was able to undo that plan after his death. And those noblemen were set free. And for the first time in a little while, there was some joy in that time. Because Herod was finally dead. Ding dong, the witch is dead. Except there was another one that came right after him. His kingdom was divided into four kingdoms. Four of his sons took over. Herod Antipas, who became the king over Judea during the time of Jesus, was the one who ultimately put Jesus to death. And so the story of treachery and murder continued in Galilee and Judea even during the time of Jesus. Now you might ask, why in the world is this in the Bible and more importantly, why in the world would I preach about this eight days before Christmas? And I think there's a lesson in here for us about the world we really live in. You see, the story of Christmas, his story must become our story. And as we think about the story of Herod, there are a couple ways in which his story and the story of the messy Christmas actually touches and intersects our lives in a number of key ways. Let me try and draw it out for you a little bit. The first way that I think it touches our lives is to acknowledge openly and freely that the story of Jesus is a story about sin treachery, deceit, and even murder. That Jesus came into a world to redeem exactly that kind of world. And if we're ready to acknowledge it in many ways, in some ways at least, there's a little bit of Herod in each one of us. Let me, let me think with you a little bit about that. I came across a, a little blog this week that talked about Herod and it said this, Herod's massacre was an attempt to kill the Christ child. He could not bear the possibility that his own power would be infringed, that he would ever stoop to become king, and that a king greater than him would arise. He was possessed by a prideful sovereignty, a panic over losing his highly position. He was, by all available standards, a control freak. See, here's the thing about Herod. He only wanted himself to be king. But do you know what the story of Christmas tells us? There's only room for one king and it ain't us. There's only room for one king, the Messiah king, the humble king that we sang about. He is the only one. At his name every knee will bow, including Herod. Every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory and praise of God. Christmas is a declaration that there's only room for one king at Christmas. And Herod realized that scary truth, that to accede to anyone else was to lose control. Now you and I don't have the opportunity perhaps to exercise our control that way. We can't just snap our finger and have people fall at our feet. But there's many ways in which we try and seek to maintain control in our lives when in reality we really don't have it. Every one of us needs to learn to bow down at the feet of the only King of Kings and Lords of Lords. And until we realize that in our lives, we're playing Herod. We're trying to have control, but that control is not ours. On my way over to church today, I queued up on my playlist uh, one of my favorite songs, We All Bow Down. I won't sing it for you, but the words go a little bit like this. Princes and paupers, sons and daughters, kneel at the throne of grace. Losers and winners, saints and sinners, one day we'll see his face. And we all bow down. Kings will surrender their crowns. It's the one thing Herod didn't want to do. 
It's the one thing King me and us doesn't want to do either. You know what the solution to that is? It's the solution that Herod deceptively said he was going to do. Come and tell me where he is so that I may worship him. The reality is the only way we can overcome King me and us, the Herod within us that wants to control and dominate our lives, is to bow down and worship him. For he is the king. He is above all nations. He is my king. Can you say that today? I've given my control of my life over to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Fighting that Herod complex within all of us is an important story of Christmas that we shouldn't forget. There's another way in which the story of, of Herod can tie in with our story, and that is acknowledging the innocence among us. The story is a terrible story, the story of the slain, innocent children of Bethlehem. What do we do with a story like that? How do we make that story preach? How do we deal with hardship in our lives? Can, can, can Christmas touch even the hardship and the pain in our lives? Back in 1989, a Romanian pastor by the name of Laszlo Tokes tells of trying to prepare a Christmas message in a tiny mountain church in Romania. He had been exiled there, and as a Romanian pastor, his mistreatment at the hands of the communist ruler Ceausescu outraged the country and ultimately led to his overthrow. But at this time, he's sitting there exiled, and he's thinking, what can I preach to these people that are going through so much turmoil and so much hardship? And he started flipping through the Bible, and he read through Matthew, and he read through Luke, and then he went back to Matthew chapter 2. And as he read the story of Matthew chapter 2, he chose as his text the very text that we looked at today. The description of Herod's massacre of the innocents. He said, it was the single greatest passage that spoke to my people where they were at that moment in their lives. You see, he understood that oppression, fear, and violence was the daily plight of his people. And, and he took a text that he knew would resonate with them. And he said, this is what Christmas is about. Jesus has come into that kind of a world, the kind of world that they were living in in Romania in 1989. Well, it turns out the next day Christmas broke and news broke that Ceausescu was arrested. Church bells rang and joy broke out all over Romania. Another King Herod had fallen, Tokes said. All the events of the Christmas story now had a new brilliant dimension for us, a dimension of history rooted in the reality of our lives. For those of us who lived through them, the days of Christmas 1989 represented a rich, resonant embroidery of the Christmas story, a time when the providence of God and the foolishness of human wickedness seems as easy to comprehend as the sun and the moon over the timeless Transylvanian hills. And for all the time in four decades, Romania had finally celebrated Christmas as a public holiday for the first time. You see, this is the Christ who came into our broken world. You say, my life is a mess right now. My life is broken. What can Christ do for me? This is the very world. The, these, we are the very people that Christ came to redeem. He came into that kind of a world, a world filled with murder and treachery. And he, and he walks into that world and says, here I am. I'm here to, to heal your brokenness. This is the kind of world that Jesus came into. This is the kind of Jesus we serve. There's a final way in which I think this story can resonate with us, and it's by acknowledging the Rachels around us even today. The story is told after the infants are killed in Bethlehem. Matthew points out that this is a fulfillment of a prophecy. He says in verse 17, after describing the massacre of the innocents in Bethlehem, he says, then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Rama, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. 
Matthew is saying throughout the history of Israel, there had been times of great mourning and weeping. It's as if Rachel, the, the mother of the Jewish people, would rise up and weep every time the Jews were oppressed, every time their sons were carted off to exile, every time armies would come in and invade the country. Once again, Rachel would stand up and weep for her children who were lost. And once again, it happened. Even as Jesus was born, once again, her sons had been slaughtered. Once again, if you listened closely, you could hear her voice. She was weeping once again. We often forget that the very first Christmas was a time of great joy, yes, but also a time of mourning. You know, for, for many people today, this time of the year is a difficult time of the year. For some of you, 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 you wish that it would be over soon. Because during this time, as everyone is joyful and festive, a part of you is hurting. A part of you is mourning. Mourning the loss of someone. Mourning the loss of, of maybe something physical in your life. Maybe it's your health and your strength. Maybe it's your, your finances. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. It's a relationship. There are many of us who go through this Christmas season and it's sort of a blue Christmas for us. There is one who came into this world. He's called the man of sorrows. A man acquainted with grief. He, he is talked about in Hebrews chapter 4 as the great high priest who is not unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in every way like us, yet without sin. And so the Bible says, let us go to him in our time of need. You see, Jesus understands the blueness of, the sorrow and the mourning that we feel. That's the world he came into. That's the world he came to meet and redeem. And even in this moment of time when, when there's so much festivity around us, some of us are hurting, some of us are mourning, some of us are crying. You can hear Rachel weeping in our voice. And that is exactly why Jesus came into this world, to meet us in the middle of our sorrow to bring us through it. Jesus came into that very world. And so, yes, this story of Herod is, is ugly. This story of Herod is filled with murder and intrigue and treachery. Why in the world did I bring it up? But as we scratch the surface a little more, we realize, huh, there's a lot of Herod in me. Wow. There's a lot of pain in this world. I guess Jesus came to, to heal it. I guess Jesus came to, to deal with my sin and brokenness too. It's not all just cheery, singy, happy all the time. There are days in which Jesus meets us in our worst moments. And that's why Jesus came and so I say to you, Merry Christmas, because Jesus came for all of our days, including some of the toughest days of our lives. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for sending your Son into this world a world of brokenness and sin, yes, but a world that you came to redeem. I thank you that you sent your son, and Jesus, I thank you that you came into this very world, that when you looked down upon this world, you were willing to come, knowing the full cost, knowing the full pain you would endure, knowing all the turmoil that you would cause because you had a plan to redeem it. And that gives us hope that you can walk into our brokenness, that you can walk into our sin, and you can redeem us too. The only thing that we need to do is learn to worship, bow down at your knee. 
And so, Lord, I pray that you would teach us to, to bow our knee to the only King of kings and Lord of lords. Help us, Lord, to take our brokenness. Help us to take our, our, our sadness to you. Help us, Lord, to find relief in our pain and our hurt. But help us, Lord, to be transformed so that we can with joy say, the Lord has come and he's made all the difference in my life. I pray these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.